recordings. Right. So this meeting is being recorded. Today we have Courtney, Courtney Masarado. She is a certified nurse midwife at Boston Medical Center and a clinical instructor of obstetrics and gynecology at Boston University School of Medicine. She received her MPH with a focus on international maternal child health from Tuland University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. She completed her RN certificate and Master of Science in Nursing with certification as both as a certified nurse midwife and family nurse practitioner at the Vanderbilt University School of Nursing. She has been providing full scope midwifery care at Boston Medical Center and an affiliated community health center since 2014. She is also one of the main providers at Boston Medical Center Refugees Women's Health Center. She has worked internationally in Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean, and her area of interest is global maternal health. Today, Courtney will be sharing with us part of our study that she has been doing, um, entitled Share Decision Making for Women's Choices Above Mode of Birth About a Previous Caesarean Section patient and provider perspective. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Courtney Massaro. Thank you. Courtney, you can go ahead. Great. Well, thank you, Cynthia, for that um, kind introduction. So as Cynthia said, I'm going to talk today about shared decision making from women's choices about mode of birth after a previous C-section. And we're going to go over some um, background information about that and then get into a study that a colleague of mine and I have conducted at Boston Medical Center looking at both a patient and provider perspective of shared decision making. So I have no financial disclosures. The objectives of the talk today are include to define and review key terminology related to cesareans and mode of birth options after C-sections. Also to discuss shared decision making and decision yeah. tools and to examine new data about mode of birth, about birth counseling tools and mode of birth delivering choices. So as far as the current state of delivery goes, um, overall cesarean deliveries have been increasing over the past 20 years, but there has been a great effort to work to decrease those rates. The World Health Organization has recently um, published a, a position statement per urging providers to perform C-sections only when medically necessary, and they are one of many organizations that have, have um, urged providers to do so. Globally, from 1990 to 2014, 18.6% of all births were C-sections. Um, and in the United States, in, in 2014, excuse me, the C-section rate was 32.2. Uh, my colleague recently, or yesterday, just told me that 2015 data came out um, and that the C-section rate in the United States was 32.0. Um, and so this, although 32% is higher than I would like or many midwives I think in the United States would like um, and higher than many places around the world, um, it is a decline and it's the lowest rate since 2007. And so all of these efforts to decrease the Syrian rates, all efforts to decrease the Syrian rates are important. Um, those to decrease primary cesarean rates are vital as women who haven't had a primary C-section don't have to have any question about a mode of birth option with their next delivery. And efforts to decrease repeat cesarean rates are important um, as women who are able to have a labor after C-section or have a vaginal birth after C-section um, then are decreasing those repeat cesarean rates. And then a little information about the vaginal birth after cesarean rates. So in the United States, the VBAC rate has slowly been increasing. In 2015, it was 11.9. And this is from a low of 2007, where our rate was 8.3. Um, but unfortunately, below our high of 28.3 in 1996. And this slow increase in the VBAC rate may be due in part to a 2010 NIH and ACOG recommendation that most women with a previous C-section, previous low transverse C-section, should be considered a candidate for a laboring after C-section. Um, and this, these statements really help to provide, um, to 
to encourage providers and hospitals that more women than originally thought could actually have a vaginal birth after C-section. And so after ACOG's announcement, the need for improved decision counseling in the context of shared decision making, in the context of a shared decision making framework really gained importance. And it was acknowledged that women needed effective strategies to support their mode of birth decision making. Um, while also it was acknowledged that, you know, many OBs, many midwives have a very busy practice um, and trying to work on balancing that counseling with patients, um, but also being able to see enough patients in a day can be very difficult. So, one of the ways that um, this adequate counseling can be done is through shared decision making. And shared decision making, the ultimate goal of shared decision making is for providers and women to make an informed decision together. And shared decision making really is, uh, involves a bi-directional flow. You can see the, the diagram up at the top. There's the providers and the patients are working together in partnership to make decisions. And shared decision making developed largely in reaction to the paternalistic model, which was used previously, where providers would say, this is you know, the treatment that you need to have, and not really involving patients in those decisions. Um, but shared decision making really emphasizes the interaction between patients patients and providers um, and allows both to have a voice within those decisions. And shared decision making has been shown to improve health outcomes, enhance communication between patients and providers, increase patients' overall satisfaction, and for pregnant women, give them an increased sense of responsibility about their health and the health of their babies. And shared decision making has been shown or excuse me, decision aids have been shown to be helpful with providers to help them make um, shared decision-making decisions with their patients. So as far as shared decision-making in the context of mode of birth after cesarean, that involves giving women balanced, evidence-based information about the risks and benefits of each option. So about having a, trying to have a labor after C-section or, or, or having an elective repeat cesarean birth. It also involves giving women the opportunities to share personal stories, values, preferences, and the beliefs about their mode of, the mode of birth. And from a counseling point of view, it involves for providers providing supportive, interactional, individualized counseling that allows women to weigh their options and work with their provider to, desire, to decide on their preferred mode of birth. And so decision aids, as I just mentioned um, have been shown to help with shared decision making. And decision aids are materials designed to help patients make informed judgments about a treatment or procedure when there are multiple options available and when the options don't have a clear advantage or when each has risks and benefits they may, that may be valued differently. And they're not designed to advise patients to choose one option or another, nor are they meant to replace discussions with healthcare providers, but they seek really to prepare patients to make informed value-based decisions with their providers. And as you can see in the illustration, we have a, our patient who is trying to make a decision. Do I go straight? Do I go left? Do I go right? And the decision aid is really trying to help the patient have a better sense of, of how to make that decision in conjunction with discussion with their provider. So some literature review about mode of birth counseling, particularly, particularly in light of using de decision aids. Um, Shorten's 2005 randomized control trial concluded that women who received a decision aid demonstrated a significantly higher increase in mean knowledge scores than those in the control group. Um, and those, they, those women also had, an inc had a decrease um, in their decisional conflict scores though the AIDS did not significantly affect their mode of delivery choices. And in two, and Shorten's article was um, kind of a landmark article for the world of VBAC counseling and VBAC decision aid research. Um, and it was actually the first um, VBAC counseling tool that was accepted within the Ottawa decision aid um, group. And in 2013, there was a Cochrane review that found that decision aids reduced decisional conflict and improved women's knowledge about mode of birth options, though again, they had no impact on mode of birth choices. 
Um, and Chinkum's 2016 study uses scripted counseling interventions and decision aids for midwives to use with patients and found that although the tools did not influence the mode of birth type, they helped to follow through on their mode of birth decisions. Um, and actually, Sampit Chinkum, the author of that 2016 study, is a colleague of mine and um, who works at Boston Medical Center. And so this literature, or the research, excuse me, that I'm going to talk to you about um, in a couple, in the next slide, really builds on that study that she did um, and was kind of the basis of, of our research. So as I was saying, the study that I'm going to talk to you about today, it was a quantitative pilot study. And it built on um, Sampit Chikam's previous study. And, and building from it, we worked to develop new counseling tools. We expanded the provider scope to provide to include all prenatal providers and not just certified nurse midwives, as Sampet had done. And after using the tools, we asked the input of providers about their opinions of the decision aids. So the aim of our study was kind of twofold, from a patient and a provider point of view. From a patient point of view, we sought to determine through pre- and post-test surveys the effect of decision aids on women's knowledge on the risks and benefits of each mode of birth option, their level of satisfaction with the decision aids, and the mode of birth, their mode of birth choices. Um, and from a provider point of view, we sought to explore prenatal providers' opinions about the new tools and their impact on shared decision making with patients. And a little bit of background about where the study was conducted. Boston Medical Center is an academic tertiary care medical center. It's the safety net hospital for the city of Boston and serves a racially and ethnically diverse population. And patients who deliver at Boston Medical Center can receive prenatal care at one of nine community health centers or at the Yawkey Ambulatory Care Clinic. And patients can be seen prenatally by midwives, nurse practitioners, OB residents, OB attendings, family medicine residents, and family medicine attendings. So we have a wide variety of, of different providers who are able to see patients. And so in 2016, the there were 2,865 births at BMC, and our C-section rate was 31.9. Um, so that's kind of right on par with the US average of, of C-section rates, which as I said in 2015 was 32.0. And our VBAC rate was 16.6, .6, which is slightly higher than um, the national average, although still something that we're working on. From a success rate, um, our VBAC rate was, we had a 57% success rate. And Boston Medical Center has a long history of working to support laboring after C-section. In 2009, there was a quality assurance improvement project to increase LAC and VBAC rates. Um, and as I already mentioned, um, Sampit Chinkum conducted her study. That was from 2000 to 13 and 2012 to 2013, excuse me, where she conducted her study with midwives and, and scripted counseling tools in hopes of trying to see about changing our or increasing our VBAC rates. And so as far as me methods go, um, all patients who were English speaking and who received prenatal care at the Yaki Clinic with midwives, nurse practitioners, and OB residents or, and attending, attendings were eligible as long as they had had um, one or two previous C-sections and were eligible to lack. And we didn't include the family medicine OBs and or family medicine residents and attendings in this section of the study um, due to just their small number of prenatal patients that they saw. So as far as our study interventions go, at the first prenatal visit, women were consented um, and given a pretest questionnaire and then given the giving birth after cesarean pamphlet, which is a pamphlet that we developed. And at the second visit and then at a, a visit between 32 and 36 weeks, providers use their provider counseling tool and one of two scripts to prompt shared decision making discussions. The two scripts were slightly different based on if it was the second visit or the 32 to 36 week visit um, and had slightly different questions. And then after that 32 to 36 week visit, the patients completed the post-test. 
And so this is just two pages of the giving birth after cesarean pamphlet that we gave to patients. It's a six page pamphlet that all of the pages, you know, look similar to this with different information. And it was given to patients at their first visit in hopes that the women would take it home, read it and help, help them to start thinking about their mode of birth options. Um, and we have it in English because our study was conducted in, in English with women who spoke English. But given our racially diverse population at the hospital, we also have the pamphlet in Spanish, Haitian Creole, and Portuguese Creole. Um, and women who didn't participate in the study but who had had previous C-sections um, have been given that pamphlet since we developed it. And then this is a, a just a picture of the provider counseling tool. It was a, it's a single page, double sided, um, laminated tool that is in all of the clinic rooms. And the goal was for providers to have kind of a cheat sheet of shorts um, to help them counsel patients. And it gave them not only visual representations for some statistics, but also information to help them guide their conversation. And I know the text is a little bit small, but if anyone's interested in, in seeing more, or getting more information about that, I can certainly give you that information later. And then this again, a very small um, example of the provider counseling script. And this was the first script. And the goal of the script was to not only help standardize providers' discussion from a, a study point of view so that we could standardize what our providers were counseling our patients about, but also to ensure that shared decision-making discussions were occurring. Um, I know that some providers have, struggle with shared decision-making, so we thought that having a script with some open-ended questions would really help providers to um, have the tools in order to, to conduct the shared decision-making discussions, that bi-directional flow of information. And so from a methods point of view from the providers, all midwives, nurse practitioners, and OB residents and attendings who saw prenatal patients at the Yaki Clinic were emailed about the study and were asked to watch a brief video about shared decision making before counseling their first patients. And then before the visits where they needed to use the counseling tools in the script, I contacted them to remind them about their patient's participation in the study and just remind them of their um, the, their need to counsel the patients using the script and the counseling tool. And at the end of the study, all of the OB providers were asked to complete an online survey. Um, and this included the certified nurse midwives, nurse practitioners, OBs, and the family medicine attendants, er, family medicine providers. Um, so that was people who had used the tools and hadn't used the tools. Um, but those who had used the tools were asked about their impact, the, how they valued the tools and their impact on patient care. Um, and those who hadn't used the tools were asked about their thoughts in general about mode of birth counseling and possible the possible usage of tools. So from the results, again, this was a pilot study. So um, we, from a patient point of view, we only had 22 women who we were able to enroll in our study. So the numbers are, are fairly small from an end point of view, but nonetheless, I still think are very valuable. Um, and this study looks at the percentage of women who had correctly answered questions on the pre and the post test. And as you can see, from the pre to the post test, um, there was an increase in knowledge about the risks and benefits of the mode of, about mode of birth options. Um, and although the changes are not statistically significant, um, uh, they, they are valuable in our eyes. And this was just a small sample of the questions that we asked them. There were many more, but um, as you can see, you know, women understood about, had a better understanding about uterine rupture, about the risks of uterine rupture, and about the benefits to trying to have a vaginal birth after C-section. And then um, this, study, this table shows the percentage of women who rated agree or strongly agree when asked about the giving birth after cesarean pamphlet and their provider counseling. And you can see that women were very positive in regards to the pamphlet and their provider counseling. And again, this is a small sample of the questions that um, they were asked, but five out of seven of the questions that I selected were 100% um, for their patient's satisfaction as far as 
the pamphlet and their provider counseling. And you can see that women felt that the pamphlet was useful, that it should be provided to all patients, that it wasn't biased, and they felt like they were given enough information. And then as far as the provider counseling goes, um, that they weren't pressured, that they felt they were able to fully participate in their care and really have shared decision making with their provider. And then from a mode of birth kind of um, point of view, the chart, this chart shows women's decision about mode of birth before and after the intervention. And as you can see at the start of the study, 39% of women were unsure about their mode of birth choice, while at the end of the intervention in the third trimester, women, um, that number decreased to 13%. And women also became more sure of their decisions. Initially, 57%, excuse me, initially 57% of women were sure or very sure, um, but by the post-test, 81% of those women were sure or very sure. And so, you know, this points to there, there's the decrease in the uncertainty um, and that the tools in the provider counseling has really helped women make informed decisions that they can be confident in. And so from a provider, this is from a provider point of view, and though it's very busy, it shows providers' opinions on the counseling tool and script. And I know it's really busy, and I worked really hard to try and find a different way to present this, but um, this is kind of how it ended up. And it's busy because I wanted to be able to compare in one table the answers of providers who had used the script, but also those who hadn't used the script. Um, to be able to visually compare those. And so on the left-hand side, there's so much text because the providers who had used the text and those who hadn't used the text had slightly different questions. Um, and so the data shows that providers who use the text, use the tools and scripts, were more likely to agree and strongly disagree, agree and strongly agree, excuse me, with the different statements regarding shared decision-making and the usage of the tools. You can see that, um, you know, overall, most providers, even if they hadn't used the tools, felt that shared decision making was important, but that there were more differences in the percentage of, of providers who had used the tools, who thought that the patients, um, who thought that the tools were useful and or would be useful, um, and thought that the patients were comfortable asking questions. Um, and in the last, the last value on the table is statistically significant and looked at providers' opinions about if the tools helped patients understand the different mode of birth options. And the fact that that's statistically significant points to the fact that providers who use the tool really saw the value in those um, and that those who hadn't been exposed to the tools maybe didn't appreciate quite as much um, what they could be used for. And so from a conclusion point of view, um, patients had an increased knowledge, had increased knowledge on the risks and benefits of each mode of birth option. They had a high level of satisfaction with the decision aids and with their prenatal providers. They had increased confidence in their decision regarding mode of birth choices after exposure to the decision aids and shared decision making counseling. And from a provider point of view, overall there was a high level of satisfaction with decision, with the study decision aids and with shared decision making. And as I just mentioned, there was a statistically significant difference in providers' opinions about the values of the counseling tools for those who had used it and those who hadn't. Um, so I hope that this presentation has given you a better sense about the mode of birth counseling, shared decision making, and decision aids, and that this new data that we have collected regarding the use of shared decision, the use of decision aids and provider counseling scripts has helped you to appreciate the value of, of using them and um, their value in helping women make decisions regarding mode of birth choices. So I just wanted to give a thank you to um, Sampo Chigam, who is my co-PI with this study, who's actually in, on an airplane on her way to vacation, which is why she's not presenting with me, um, and Carla, who did all the data collection and analysis, and then all the patients and providers um, at Boston Medical Center. And if there are questions, I would love to try and answer some questions. All right. Thank you, Courtney. Um, so Courtney has um, presented. So we, Courtney, um, Becky is asking 
asking you to define decisional conflict? Sure. Um, decisional conflict um, is just the idea of having is the idea that um, sometimes there's not a right or a wrong answer and so there's some conflict between making decisions for providers and for patients. Mm -hmm. Hello? So it's basically um, the individual making, deciding or uncertain about a course of action to be taken when a particular choice is to be made, for example, if a risk or if it's a challenging situation. So thank you for that. Um, do we have any more questions? So it looks like there are a couple of questions in the chat room. Celine. Celine, Celine is asking Courtney, what was the reactions of the providers when the woman wanted a VBAC? Well, that's, um, it was actually very interesting um, because we included all different providers in this study rather than just midwives as um, Sampit had done in our previous study. We had actually, the majority of patients had physicians um, for their primary providers and we have a number of physicians who feel that feedbacking is not always the best for patients, um, but they really embrace this counseling. Um, and they were very good about using the counseling tools, using the scripts, and really giving patients that opportunity to voice their opinions and, and voice what they wanted to do, even if they didn't necessarily believe that it was um, kind of best. Um, so many, so overall I think the midwives are very supportive of, of vaginal births after c-section, um, but as I said I was I was delighted that all of the providers embraced the shared decision, ma shared decision making model um, and really worked towards that bi-directional flow of information with the patients and providers um, and kind of put away their own biases um, for the good of, of the patient's choices and, and really embracing what they wanted within the safety of, um, you know, ensuring that, that having a vaginal birth was not unsafe for the patient. All right. Thank you, Courtney. Um, Our DM in Denmark is asking, would you do a water birth for a VBAC? So at Boston Medical Center, we don't do water births. Um, we are, so that's unfortunately not a, an option for us. Okay. Becky's asking, did the healthcare providers that's the nurse midwives, certified nurse midwives and medical doctors have concern about liability in sheer decision making. Not as far as anyone expressed to me. Um, so not to my knowledge, no. Okay, thank you. Um, Eva is asking, how much does the tool discuss other topics than risk? Example, the postnatal period, breastfeeding, etc. Do you mean in regards to having a vaginal birth or having a, a C-section? Having a C-section, I assume. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so... so how it, does the tool discuss other topics? Yeah, so in... With the um, giving birth after cesarean pamphlet and the provider counseling tool, there is 
a small amount of discussion about the post, well, not small, there is a discussion about the postnatal period, um, about, you know, recovery times, breastfeeding, um, so that certainly is addressed, was addressed using the decision aids. Thank you, Courtney. Um, Ginger, I assume <laughs> I pronounce it correctly, um, um, is asking, did the number of ladies wanting VBAC increase or decrease? Yeah, so the number of women who wanted to VBAC increased. Um, it went from 43% in the pretest to 58% in the post-test. Mm -hmm. Celine is asking, are providers really ready to offer VBAC? I, I think so. I mean, as I said, um, th the midwives have been on board at our hospital for many, many years about vagin having VBACing. Um, and I think m the physician, our physician colleagues are really on board as well. I mean, we have institutional support from the hospital um, to really work to increase the VBAC rates um, and decrease re cesarean rates, both from a primary and a repeat point of view. Um, so I, 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 do, I do genuinely think that they um, want to offer women vaginal births um, as much as possible. Okay, thank you. I have a question. You find that women in some parts of the world are not empowered to make decisions. Mm -hmm. I don't know much about your demographic characteristics of your of your clients, but do you think that your women are that empowered to make decisions? Do they have to involve their spouses to make the decision? So that's a great question. Um, and that's a, it's a hard, hard to answer. Um, I would like to hope that my patients, our patients, are empowered enough to make the decisions and that they feel comfortable having discussions with their providers and that through these discussions with their providers, they feel like they're getting enough information. Um, but I do know that there were a number of women in the study whose partners felt very strongly one way or another, and that certainly did influence their decision. Um, and that's tough, but I think that from a provider point of view, especially here in the States, all we can do, or what I hope to do, is give mom um, enough information that she feels comfortable kind of debating with her partner if her partner feels strongly one way or another, or and also what I've done in the past is just encourage the provider, uh, encourage, excuse me, the partner to come and to be able to have discussions with them because sometimes just having a one-on-one -on -one discussion and hearing um, why uh, someone may have reservations about, you know, having another C-section or having, trying to labor after C-section, sometimes just having that one on, uh, having that in-person discussion can really help resolve any sort of conflicts and um, have have a resolution, but it it is an issue that is is present in the states and I, is present globally, as you've mentioned. Um, that I, I don't know if it's if there's an easy fix or an easy way to make sure that the woman feels confident in her decision and is able to make the decision all on her own without any kind of outside influence. Thank you so much. Um, we have one person raising hand. I think it's Emily. Um, you can go ahead and turn on your microphone. Emmy, you should be able to see a microphone icon in the top bar now. And if you click on that, you can ask your question. Thank you, Annette. I think we might have lost Emmy. She doesn't seem to appear in the okay. list. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, Catherine in USA is saying, popular culture and the media have a huge influence on the women's decision making here in the US as well. Thank you for that, Catherine. Yeah, I completely agree. One of uh, another part of the study that we did that is not in this talk was a uh, um, focus group discussions about women who had C sections who were pregnant or who were planning to be pregnant, and it was very interesting to hear what influenced them and why they thought that if they got pregnant again, if they were thinking about having a vaginal birth or having a, a repeat C section. And you're right, a lot of it comes from the media and, and from pop culture. And evidently, we have a session on that very shortly. So, <laughs> when when a decision is made for VBAC, is there a special schedule for antenatal visit? Do you stick to the traditional schedule, or you know, do you modify the schedule? Is there a need for that? No, I mean here at. At where I work, it's just the traditional schedule. Um, after 36 weeks, they're seen every week, um, but that there's no difference in visits if someone wants to have a vaginal birth after cesarean. Okay, thank you so much. If we don't have any more questions for Courtney, Annette, could we um, conclude? Yeah. yeah, we people are typing still. I also want to, to say that if someone wants to ask Courtney a question and speak, you still have the possibility uh, to to get the, the microphone right. Then you just need to raise your hand or or uh, by using the, the man with the hand in the air in the top bar, uh, and, and then we will give you a microphone right, and, and you can ask uh, questions directly to Courtney if you want to. And, and, and it seems like there's still coming uh, comments and, and questions in, in, the, in the chat, so we'll just uh, see if there's... Catherine, I, I totally agree with your comment about you that uh, there is a decision is uh, the impact of the decision related to post-tates. Um, that is something that is in both the provider counseling tool and the pamphlet that we gave patients of kind of ways to help increase their r rate of having a, a vaginal birth after C-section if that's what they wanted to do. And one of them was to try and avoid being post-tates and trying to avoid an induction. So we do offer membrane stripping and um, talk about kind of non-pharmacological ways that women can um, encourage labor to start if that's something that they're interested in. Thank you, Courtney. Eva is saying that if any person is interested in making a tool, I she said, or you said, I can recommend the IPDAS decision-making tool and some other good examples from the Queensland, Australia. A question is asked, what gestation is posted though? Here, um, it is 41 plus five gestation. That's a year in UK, 41 plus five. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Um, at, in Boston Medical Center, we consider post-dates after 41 and 0. Um, so there is some variation in, in what different hospitals and, and different kind of countries consider post-dates. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Okay, if we do not have uh, more questions coming up, uh, we will like to thank Courtney for a very interesting presentation. And um, I'll just go through the ending slide because uh, 